series presented to you by the Department of Economics School of Humanities, St. Joseph College Autonomous, in collaboration with the Economics Forum and Oikonomica. Today's lecture on higher studies abroad, pro tips and SOPC secrets will be given by the esteemed alumni of our college, Ms. Divya Rosalind David. To begin with, I would like to invite Mr. Clement D'Souza, Dean of the School of Humanities, to address the gathering. Good evening, all of you present here. Um, Ms. Anita, head of the department, Divya, our guest speaker, and all dear students. Uh, we are happy to have this program, especially for a few reasons. Uh, let me tell one line about Divya. As a student, she was very bubbly. Uh, we use normally a statement uh, about Almighty, that is, we, Almighty in the near sense that omnipresent and omnipotent. And this suits to Divya. She was always all around the campus when she was a student, either in this activity or another activity. Plus, not only that, she was she had a greater what you call a knowledge about all activities. She was inspiration to many people. And we are rightly having a right person to speak about the opportunities abroad. My one statement to all of you is that, uh, based on the inspirational story of uh, Divya, we don't have to actually uh, polish glass ceilings. We have to always be present to break it. That should be our motivation. And today when Divya speaks about it tells us that uh, we cannot become what we want by remaining what we are. Therefore, kindly listen to Divya. It is a source of inspiration, information, and also a platform for us to change your lives. So when she gives the innermost tips about how to go abroad, it will be a, a, a good direction for especially those who are in a crossroads. A uh, warm welcome, Divya, once again, and uh, happy information to all my students and participants and best wishes to the organizers, uh, head of the department and others. So thank you and best wishes for the guest lecture. Thank you very much, sir. I would like now like to invite Ms. Anita Norona, the head of the Department of Economics, to address the gathering and to give some give us some more information about our guest speaker. A very good morning, uh, Divya. Uh, I know it's early morning for you. Thanks for joining us. And a very good evening to all the participants here. We've had an overwhelming response to this particular lecture with nearly 400 registrations. And um, as uh, probably as the uh, evening progresses, we may have uh, more participants joining us. So brief introduction about our guest speaker. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce my student, Divya Rosalind David, an alumna of the IES batch of 2012. Uh, Divya was a very active student, whether it was uh, economics forum, whether it was social zest, whether it was the Industrial Relations Forum or even the English Department activities, she was always at the forefront. She was an inspiration to many students uh, during her stay at St. Joseph's and also after she left the portals. And I see how popular she is. You know, when we posted about this particular lecture, a lot of her juniors literally were so excited that Divya is going to address um, the Josephites today. So a little bit of information about what Divya did after she left the portals of St. Joseph's College. She's a recipient of the Pranath Bell Memorial Scholarship that fully funded her MSc at the University of Oxford, United Kingdom. Currently, she's the story editor at Menstrupedia and is the founder of the Indian Women's Project. Divya is also a professional SOP consultant based out of California and has had former student clients from all over the world gain admission into Cornell, Oxford and Yale, among several other universities. 
Divya is also a trained uh, uh, soft skills trainer. Uh, she has always been with her father, Mr. David, who uh, is also a, a well-known soft skills trainer. Right from her student days, she has helped a lot of students. She has also edited a lot of books. Um, so an accomplished writer, an accomplished uh, human being. Overall, I would say, you know, a very down to earth personality. So thank you so much, Divya, for accepting our invitation and for being a part of this lecture series. And I hope our students would truly benefit from this particular lecture. All the very best and God bless. Thank you very much, ma'am. And, and a warm welcome to Ms. Divya. Before the lecture begins, I would like to ask all of you, the participants, to ensure that the mics and cameras remain switched off. Any queries and questions will be taken up at the end of the lecture. In the meantime, if you do have any questions, you can type them out in the chat box and we will compile them and present them to ma'am. Uh, th thank you, ma'am. And I'd like to request Ms. Divya to go ahead. Thank you, everyone, for the very warm welcome. What um, Sir and Ma'am uh, didn't uh, tell you was that I was actually also very naughty, but that's a different story. Um, but it was, um, you know, I, I really blossomed in Joseph's um, because Joseph gave me a platform to just, you know, be who I was. Um, it was a space where I could, you know, um, be, you know, as enthusiastic as I wanted to and people would encourage me. And that's something that I don't think is, you know, like I... I I, I left um, a very uh, a famous um, university whose name I won't take, and I joined Joseph's. I, I was a late um, joiner, and I, and I and I think I think that has been easily one of the best decisions I've taken with my life because it gave me the chance to, you know, um, kind of um, it bolstered me to do other things. So, yeah, okay, let's start. Um, as I said, um, you know, it's kind of um, amazing that there's so many of you who want to um, go abroad. Uh, while this talk, this talk is going to be about studying abroad, I also want to tell you at the very outset that I'm going to be touching upon why it's also a good idea to stay in India. Okay, so I want you to I want you to to have a holistic perspective on um, on on um, you know on the different options that are available to you. And I don't want you to um, you know straightjacket yourself into thinking that um, you know going abroad is the only option because it it truly isn't. It's an amazing option and I feel like it's made me, it's helped me to grow and become a global citizen. But I, but I, we'll come to it later, but I, I, I want you to kind of um, be here with an open mind. If you have any questions that uh, come up, just um, reflect on them. And if they're not answered even till the end, um, you know, do go ahead and ask me in the Q&A section. I've kept a generous amount of time for the Q&A because I know that a, a, lot, a lot of people usually um, take more time on the Q&A than anything else. So without any further ado, um, we'll begin. Um, oh, sorry, could you um, move ahead with the slideshow? Who's who's presenting, by the way? Uh, Mom, it's Leah. Here she is the technical head. Okay, thanks, Leah. Um, so, okay, uh, I'm not going to show off anymore because uh, people have showed off for me. So, could we move on? I mean, suffice it to say that I, you know, I studied in, um, as I studied at Oxford. I also went for a Neth Netherlands um, government fellowship in the Netherlands for a couple of months, and I've just done a couple of courses. But I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, uh, soon, I did. I did a couple of things to ensure that my profile looked and felt a certain way, and and as we go on in this presentation, we'll um, we'll touch upon those basics. Um, now, if you are at this position in your life where you're thinking, "Hey, do I is study abroad for me? Is this is this something that I should be doing?" And if you are saying, "Oh, the only reason I want to do it is because I'm done. I'm done with India. I want I want to go to another country." Um, I'm going to um, probably challenge some of your assumptions and say, hey, um, there are other better reasons for studying abroad if you so choose to, but it doesn't have to be your only option. Um, oh, could you, sorry, Leah, could you move ahead? Um, and I think, and I think uh, one of the things that you, that you need to consider is when you start looking at, um, you know, often the, the biggest confusion that people have, and when a lot of people come to me, they say, I don't know where to begin. I don't know where to start. I know that I want to go abroad. I know that I want to be you know, successful, 
but I just don't know where to begin. And I always tell people that look, um, especially when I, and, and I learned, learned this um, more so when I went to Oxford, every single person who I had met there had worked backward. They didn't, they didn't say, oh, uh, I'm, I'm in Oxford, therefore, therefore I'm going to do all these things. They said, I want to go to Oxford, therefore I'm going to do all these X, Y, Z things to ensure that I get to Oxford. So everyone, including myself, you know, um, I was in extracurriculars, I was writing, I was, I was, I was editing, I was, um, I was, you know, I was in, uh, I was in the acapella group in CSA, I was doing like a whole bunch of things. But it wasn't without, um, you know, a sense of purpose, I, I, I kind of knew what kind of a profile I wanted to design for myself. And I worked back, I, I worked backwards from my goal, my goal was, I want to go to a top university in the world. It doesn't have to be I didn't think, oh, it's going to be abroad. I just thought I want to go to top university, full stop. What do top universities look at? They look at um, having a, a well-rounded profile. They don't care only about your grades. They care about so many other things. And so and so, what I did was I worked backward. I ensured that I had extracurriculars. I ensured that I was, uh, the only thing that I, I was terrible, I was awful at was sports. So I said, you know what, I this is just something I can't, I can't even fake it. So I, I left sports alone, but everything else, I, I had like a good profile. But honestly, people who have sports on their resume are probably the best off because then they can just, you know, use the use the um, quota and get in to the sports quota in a lot of universities, even abroad. So um, so I, I ensure that I that I'd created and that I designed for myself uh, a well-rounded background. Plus, I got, you know, decent grades and together that ensured that I could, you know, get into the universities that I wanted to see myself in. So, um, you know, envision where you want to be and then reverse engineer your life. Now, I want you to know that you might do all the right things, right? And still, um, things may not work out the way you plan plan for them to work out. And that's, and, and, and so, and so when you are, um, you know, Again, I'm going to use the word designing your profile. I'm going to use the phrase designing your profile a lot. And I want you to start thinking about, oh, am I am I designing my profile in a way that's all like, you know, all over the place? Or am I designing my, my life in a way that shows that I have some sense of direction? I have some sense of, oh, uh, I want to do maths in, in, in my master's. Oh, so d- does that mean that I've I've done I've been a part of the statistics group? Does that mean that I've taken a couple of extra courses on uh, from other universities? How how have I ensured that my profile is designed to ensure that I would get into a top math masters in mathematics program in the world? Uh, so so now you might uh, coming back to that you might do everything right and you might not even make it, but the idea is to do as many things right as possible to ensure that you have as foolproof a plan as possible, right? There's no guarantees, but you do everything that you can from your part to ensure that things work out. Um, Also, now, if you are in your final year, uh, you probably know that the deadlines for the UK are, um, I think in November and December, some have already begun, some some are gonna like um, extend it out till March, but usually the scholarship deadlines are December and Jan. Um, which means you're already thinking about your resume, you're already thinking about your your SOP. Now, the one thing that I would encourage all of you to do is to have dedicated mind space, by which I mean every single day you should be spending a minimum of 30 minutes looking up and researching, um, you know, you know, the universities you want to study at, the different, um, you know, funding options you, you, you have in your hand. Basically, get a virtual space, by which I mean an Excel sheet. Uh, get a hard copy space by which I mean a notebook um, you know and write all this down put all this on record because um, because you might have like a whole mass of unorganized data on your head but applying abroad is in fact a very organized process Um, so whatever you know um, chaos is in your head the idea is to use that mind space to use your time to use your excel sheet and your notebook to to, to together, you know, coherently come together to to form um, a solid strategy for you going abroad and for your application to be successful. Um, could you move forward, Leah? Thanks. Okay. So um, when you say, okay, I want to go abroad. I have uh, now. I've decided. I definitely, I definitely have to, you know, apply if not anything else. 
um a lot of students who've come to me in the past have been pretty delusional they like i mean they just like come to me and they're like oh i want to go abroad i want i want to study in this university and i'm like oh that you know it doesn't really work that way you have to do much much more than that to um to you know even 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 know where to apply so i want you to ask yourself um three important questions one um do you want to emigrate or do you want to study and come back because those are two different things and your study and 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 the and the places you apply to will differ based on whether you want to emigrate or study and come back personally i never wanted to emigrate it's a different story i married an american guy and emigrated but i never wanted to leave the country my plan was that i would study i would probably do a phd abroad i would travel the world and then i would come back that was that was my eventual plan um but a lot of people say no actually i i want to emigrate now the thing is um say you wanted to emig- say you wanted to emigrate right say you wanted to live in a different country and live there forever and never return to india as a as a citizen now your plan would be completely completely different you know uh, i i i know i know people who who were like oh i'm going to go and this is i'm talking about my time okay like when i was this was uh, when i d- did my master that was 2014 um and i know i know, I know a lot of people who were like oh i'm going to go to the uk and i'm going to emigrate and i'm i'm going to live in the uk but the uk wasn't interested in keeping anybody um you know with them they were like no you study you pay the fees and then you leave um and so a lot of people took on these heavy loans on their heads which they were eventually going to pay off in indian rupees um and it was it was just not practical um i still know a lot of my friends who are you know paying off their debt and it's quite it's quite an unsustainable and quite a you know at the end of the day quite a, quite a unhappy um, end to things right it shouldn't have happened uh, but that's because people were not thinking about you know visa rules and regulations that might work uh, against people so i want you to think about uh, whether you want to leave the country and and live abroad or whether you want to do an international masters or an international phd go see the world go get you know friends from abroad have your global exposure have your fill and then come back and make an impact in the country you need to think about those things for some people there is no option right for some people you might have to um you know jump through the loops of generational wealth to to get to you know where your family needs to be right and and that means you might you might say that no look i would love to study in the uk where uh, i could have a fancy name attached to my resume but i in fact need to emigrate to say canada which is usually the the country with which is the most open to people and and then and then you might have to plan your entire you know you might have to design your entire profile for a canadian uh, university and not for a, sorry um someone's uh, mic um so you might you might you, you might have to uh, you know plan, design your entire profile to uh, for for canada or you might have to design your profile for um you know studying at a top university hopefully getting a scholarship and then, and then and then returning back um if you are dependent on a scholarship and if you're not dependent um on um you know uh, i mean some people some people are like i'm rich i'm just going to go abroad i'm going to get that status symbol and then i'm going to come back or i'm going to you know do do other things from there that lend so that i live abroad and so and so the way in which you're going to approach your life uh uh your privileged life is going to be quite different from the way in which uh you know um like for example someone like me was approaching my options because i didn't have the option of you know getting a study loan um my option was if i went i would go to the uk uh because in the uk there are more scholarships whereas in countries like you know canada or australia the scholar there are, there are, the scholarships in my in my area of study were so less that i i may as well as have not um applied um so i said you know what i'm just going to go get a free education and come back and thankfully for me that worked out it doesn't you know sometimes um, especially in countries like the uk and europe um they even if they don't give you like a full scholarship they give you a pretty gen- in many cases if you've got a de- decent profile they, they at least give you a generous stipend um so so for me for me there was no option i i was completely dependent on a scholarship um and then there's another group of people that sort of uh, fall uh, in the middle to higher categories of affordability which is either you completely can afford to pay for your program you know or your parents take a education loan out for you um and and then you pay it back 
and even if you can't pay it back your parents want to pay it back you know you have money it's not a problem so i think once you consider these three key points um and question yourself and say hey if if i can't you know if if i'm dependent on a scholarship um then i would have to design my profile in a certain way if i am dependent on a scholarship and i want to emigrate i would have to design my my profile in a certain way if i can afford to pay for my program see if you can afford to pay for your program it doesn't matter whether you want to emigrate study and come back uh you yeah like the doors are pretty much more or less open for you right but if you depend on a scholarship and then you want to study and come back that's one thing but if you are dependent on a scholarship and you want to emigrate now those that's a diff- that's an entirely different um different thing altogether so um usually you would have to uh you know do your research in the area this is a this is a tip that um i've been giving a lot of people every single country okay now and this is for the the folks at at number 1 i want to emigrate um every single country that is big on um on emigration uh, on immigration you know on having people come into their country to provide skill labor um usually has a list that they put out you know i think it's called uh, a a skill labor shortage list or um a long a long term skill requirement list i think i mean i know australia has it i know new zealand has it and canada has it so if you're saying oh i want to emigrate then look up those lists and see if your profile can be tailored to any of those career options that might ensure that you get to stay there for a long time because see the thing is if you do like a generic degree say you do like a degree in english literature right now that might not be on the oh i love english literature i'm not saying it's a bad thing i'm just saying that if you wanted to emigrate it might not be the best option um so 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 say so say you so say your 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 degree is in english literature and you do your masters in english literature and then you look at the long term and the short term skill shortage list in new zealand or australia or canada and you say oops um you know none of my none of my uh, education qualifications ensure that i can apply through one of these you know skill shortage categories which means you're put in the general category and the general category probably has tons of applications of immigrants from all over the world who who have an english lit degree and want to get into communications right now that's going to decrease your chances of of getting an get, getting um an entry into another country so then you don't do english literature you know then you do something else you do something that ensures that you get to stay so so look into look into these these kind of um you know concerns the the other thing is um i know for a fact that a lot of people now batch um they actually finish their masters degrees and then they put in their papers for you know immigration to canada for example so you don't have to you don't have to uh you know um kind of uh you, you don't have to limit your options uh but i want you to make clever decisions about about the ones that are available to you uh, by which i mean look up these skill shortage lists um look up whether uh, you know going abroad and coming back is is an option after which if you say hey actually i kind of i kind of want to um stay abroad oh and by the way that reminds me a lot of people actually go abroad and then realize they want to stay you know and that is going to be like w- once you're in that situation um things things can get a little messy because like i i know i i know i had friends who were like oh me no i want to come back to india and i want to serve in india but then they go abroad and they're like mm, no actually i think i quite like it here and i think those people were the ones who who are kind of um stuck because because they found themselves really enjoying being uh, in another country but simply weren't able to <clears throat> figure out a way to to stay back you know um and then you know they'd either apply for a phd that was self funded or they'd um, you know go in for like a you know measly paying corporate job that that didn't keep them happy but that ensured that they stayed back um you know so and that wasn't in line with say what what they initially studied so there's there's a lot of um different scenarios uh but my overall advice is do everything that you can um to ensure that the best case scenario plays out in your life but i also want you to prepare for the worst case scenario and i say this particularly for people who say you know i and i think this is something this is a mental game right a lot of people people once they see that see that offer letter of admission from a from a university abroad they say oh you know what i 
I haven't got a scholarship, but I think I'm going to take an education loan on my on my parents' house, and I'm going to go because they get really like people get really you know excited about the fact that oh I, see I got this uh, fancy you know uh, university that's uh, that's admitted me now I really have to go, and I and I would encourage you to not fall into that trap because if you think about it like like even the most obvious common sense thing is if you have thirty forty lakhs to spare, you should be you know I don't know buying another. plot of land that will increase its <coughs> revenue uh uh that 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 will give you more money than say an educational loan uh that will that will in fact give you less money and in the end of the end of the day if it's not like you know like a yale or a harvard or a you know or an oxford or a cambridge that money might actually even with an with oxford or cambridge i, I like when i did not hear back from the scholarship that i had applied to or, uh, at the beginning I told my parents I was like look there is no point in taking an educational loan I I know that I've gotten in and I'm okay with it uh you know but I don't want you to you know go and take a loan and then you know me starting my entire career with a loan on my head and then saying oh my god I have this loan on my head now I really have to do something uh that I might not enjoy doing you know uh so so the thing is the thing is I would I would say don't don't get uh you know drawn into that trap that that's a very tempting trap uh and it's it's ruined family life it's, ru- it's i i i have a very a dear friend from our batch who now has he has like a huge massive loan on his head and the kind of pressure and stress that he's going through is a bit it's it's you know it's 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 stressful um so um so i so i want you to think about the worst case scenario okay you say you get in say you say actually this place that i'm applying to uh um, a lot of and a lot of people do this with america by the way because if if you apply through stem that is you know science technology um uh, i don't know engineering mathematics if you're on don't quote me on this i really should have looked that up um but if you're applying on a stem in a, in a stem field what happens with stem is a lot of people say i'm going to do a masters in a stem field and then i'm going to put myself in the h1b lottery and i have a pretty high probability of getting in it's usually the probability is um you know uh 50 50 so so they say okay i'm going to take this massive educational loan of say a crore uh and i'm going to go abroad but but there's also like this small chance that there's like a glitch in your paperwork and then you may not get it you may not you may not get the h1b and then you're stuck without a de- without with a with a really fancy degree with a huge educational loan and you're sent back to india so so you know what do you what do you do then so uh most people usually have a worst case scenario in mind uh the worst case scenario uh bolster that most people have in mind is to um you know they they ensure that that they have a dormant you know plot of land lying around in case in case they have to pay it off through land uh but a lot of people don't have these you know worst case scenario preparations and that's what i i hope you don't get into and and that's what and 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 and, and i encourage you to think about whether or not you have enough bolsters for your worst case scenario and if you don't have enough safety nets to take the safest decision possible which is to not get into um you know a bad situation with with money um so think about these questions these are the, the top three questions i tell everyone to ask do you want to emigrate or study uh, do you want to emigrate or study or study and come back are you dependent on a scholarship and can you afford to pay for your program with or without a loan um Leah, could you move forward, please? Okay. Now, if you say, "Hey, I am dependent on a scholarship," then here's how this is. This is where we get really organized. Then you say, "Okay, I'm going to go to scholarship positions." Oh, you can take that down, by the way. Scholarshippositions.com is my go-to website for any scholarship ever. Um, but you know, there's a whole host of other other platforms as well. Um, so do your research first look up scholarships don't look up your courses first if you are completely completely dependent on a scholarship you don't have those many options okay um so that means if you are if you are seeking full funding first you look at the scholarships then you look at the the subjects that the scholarship covers and then you pick the the programs that best that are best suited to your profile and that you then and, and that you are interested in but you don't say oh i would really fancy studying fashion technology and then say 
oh, but is there any scholarship for it? Probably not, right? And if you're dependent depend on a scholarship, then then you kind of have to do that. You know, you have to you have to just take the practical approach and say, okay, I'm going to first look at scholarships. I'm going to see what scholarships are available for which subjects, and then I'm going to um, you know work work from there. So so I'll I'll, I'll just give you my example, right? Um, I was very particular that I wanted to study gender studies. Okay. Um, I don't know if all of you have been taught by Berin Ma'am, but um, she she was, um, you know, she was quite a feminist teacher and I quite liked um, all the things that she used to say. And so I got into my head that I wanted to study gender and that I, and that I wanted to research gender because my, my area of specialization at the time was menstrual anthropology. I mean, I still work in the area of menstruation. Um, and I really wanted to apply I, and I really wanted to get into SOAS. Um, so SOAS is like, you know, the JNU of India. Uh, so SOAS is the JNU of the UK. Um, and I said, oh, I, you know, I really kind of want to um, explore this subject area more. And I would love for, uh, I would love for, for um, I would love to get into a, into, a, into a program that allows me to do that. But the subject that I ended up studying in at Oxford was an MSc in contemporary Indian research, right? And that was great, right? But it wasn't, it wasn't gender studies. I still had to study like a whole lot of international relations, political economy, um, you know, development studies, and 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 it it wasn't it wasn't that I hated those subjects. It's just that they they wouldn't have been my first choice. But did I get fully funded for Oxford or did I get fully funded for SOAS? I got fully funded for Oxford. So I said, okay, obviously I'm going to go to Oxford because I clearly can't afford it. Um, and the reason I'd applied to that course in the first place is because I was working backwards. I I first looked at scholarships that were available and it appeared that there were several scholarships that were covering the you know that that were that that, that, that were covering the ambit of South Asian studies that were covering the ambit of development um, research and so on and so forth and so I worked backward from there and said okay if I apply to this particular course my probability of getting into the course a is high and b uh, my chance of getting a scholarship in this area of research is also equally high um, a side note, um, a lot of the top universities in the world have a lot of funding. They have a lot of endowments and therefore they have a lot of funding. So um, I know a lot of you think, oh, maybe I'm punching above, uh, you know, my level. And the thing is, I, I would like, A, stop thinking that. That's a very like, I mean, when I was applying to Oxford, people were like, are you sure you want to apply to Oxford? And I was like, you know, I mean, Anita Ma'am wrote a, wrote a lot of my reference letters, and I think Clemenceau also did. And and like, you know, some teachers were like, no, actually go for it. But not everyone was that encouraging, you know. But I would still say apply to the top universities, even if it's like one of your backup uh, universities. Do it because if you get in the chance of you, of you getting funding are quite high because they have more money. It's really as simple as that. So, uh as opposed to popular notion, uh, you know, like most of these education consultancies, they always push you towards these, uh, you know, second tier universities. Um, but actually, the top tier universities have half the most money. Um, so, you know, go to scholarships, scholarshippositions.com, look up the different subjects you're interested in, um, then look at the universities, um, you know, and make an Excel sheet, you know, like an Excel sheet is like the best way to organize your thoughts. You you put on you put on all the scholarships that are available. You put on the countries they're from. You put on the subjects they cover. Uh, you put down you know the amount they're, they're they're providing. Then you put down on another column um, the deadlines they have. In and in, in another column the the list of things that you need to um, provide to them in order to be eligible for the scholarship. Some scholarships require you to have like a really good GRE score. Some scholarships require you to have a cutoff that you may or may not meet, uh, you know, in your grades. So, so look at all those things. Oh, also, um, a word of advice for a lot. I, I know a lot of a lot of you have, you know, may have say, um, uh, not done well on one subject, or you may have had to repeat a paper in the next semester. Um, don't worry about that. Then uh, there's a hack around that with uh, Joseph's paperwork. Actually, I think it's all Bangalore University paperwork. The hack is that you um, you only send in the first couple of uh, months of uh, the, the first couple of semesters, and then later on when they ask you to, um, to 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 supply the rest of your paperwork, you just you just um, sort of 
uh, wait by by that time usually you know by the time, from the time you apply to the time you uh, get the result and you have to submit your, you know the rest of your paperwork it's about 6 to 7 months by that time you would have already written that paper and then you would have gotten an upgraded uh, mark list so only submit that upgraded mark list no one needs to know that you know you you failed in a semester um so that's a hack um, again another side note all right no more side notes okay um every scholarship generally uh, has terms and conditions uh, with it uh, for example the fulbright scholarships for study in the uk i mean in the, in the us a bigger pardon um they they usually have uh, this um requirement that you have to have had two years of work experience i think and then you have to come back to india to um to work for your country uh, and to make an impact in your country so um so you know some 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 scholarships have those terms and conditions attached um and i know a lot of my friends were like oh, i don't like that i don't like that i have these terms and conditions attached in fact i'm not going to go i'm not going i'm not going to apply for these scholarships because they have these terms and conditions attached uh, attached to them but look again my practical advice is imagine living a debt free life versus being in debt and uh and and getting, and you know and say getting to stay back for two every every country allows you to stay back or not every country but most countries allow you to stay back for two years and work um uh but you still have that debt on your head and you'll be stressed out so you know i think that's that's also like a a choice that you have to make for yourself but personally i would not recommend being a passport um all right i've already spoken about how you shouldn't choose subject first choose the area closest to your interest that is covered by the scholarship and then work from there um so first so i would say if you're dependent on scholarships instead of starting with your applications and your and the universities you want to study at start with your scholarship list start with your, with your scholarship excel sheet and then later on go on to make your your um, educational excel sheet um yes there are a lot of excel sheets involved in the process but it'll just help to um, organize your thoughts better um oh yeah and as a general rule of thumb uh, the more socially conscious your program of choice the more likely you are to get a scholarship um i know people who applied for like finance and law or like an mba or like you know um subjects that are very um that are likely likely to get you a lot of money who obviously don't get scholarships whereas a subject like uh, you know development studies or say um you know uh, any 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 anything that's more socially conscientious and conscious would likely get you a better scholarship uh get you it'll likely get you a uh, better scholarship uh um uh, you know chance wait another side note i should really stop doing this but another side note every oh wait sorry leah could you move forward i'll come to the side note hold on hopefully i don't forget it by the time leah moves the, the slide forward leah Is it just me who can't see the new slide? Oh, awesome. Um. Okay, wait. Let me before I forget my side note. Um, a thing that you should remember is that when you're looking at your university, um, app, a, a, a lot of people when they start researching courses that they want to study, don't look at the probability of of getting in. Okay. now you might think wait how do i measure that probability a lot of universities now this is not the case for a lot of universities but a lot of universities in fact um and i think and i think a decent a fair share of them uh do this i, I think it's it's become like a new oh you should provide transparency in the admission process um uh, um uh, you know our uh, dialogue but a lot, a lot of universities actually give you the number of applications received in that program versus the number of acceptances now there are courses now say now say you you really want to apply only for a top university and you're not that concerned about the subject in fact you're pretty flexible then what i would do if i were you is i would you know go to like say like I, I, you know this is, honestly this is what i did for oxford and i just looked at the look at the subjects i look at the probability of me getting in and my probability of the probability of me getting into that particular subject area was higher so i knew that there were x number of applications that were getting submitted for this course and i knew that the the cohort size was about 13 and so i knew that the number of places available versus the number of applications received 
uh, was a ratio that was favorable to me applying because I thought I had a better chance. But I know there are some courses like the, you know, like the Masters in Public Policy at Oxford, where I think there's like, you know, more than like 300 applicants and I think a very limited number, a limited number of um, places available. So my chance of getting into a course like that would have been much more slimmer. Um, so I was like, hey, you know what? It would be quite, quite nice if I got into Oxford. Um, even if it's not a subject that I like that much, but it's a subject that I, I'll still be able to, you know, personalize and tweak to my interest, which I did. Uh, and I said, hey, you know, actually, I think that that makes a lot more sense. Uh, and and I did get in, so it did pay off. Um, but the idea is that you increase your probability of getting in. Uh, both in terms of the scholarship that you apply for, so your chance of getting a scholarship are higher when, uh, when when you're uh, when you're um, you know applying for a socially conscious degree, uh, and uh, both in terms of the scholarship as well as the course you're applying for. Um, so um, the course the course was you know it had a pretty decent uh, run rate of me getting in, and I thought okay the two of them combined would. So my prob since since my probability of getting a scholarship and getting into the course were good, I thought that combination was potent, and I think that's the com that's the that's the combination that paid off in my in my journey. <clears throat> um, okay, some decision making reflections that I would um, urge you to um, ponder upon. Excuse me, I'm trying to throw it. Um, don't worry, I don't have COVID. Um, is can I afford? Okay. Uh, okay. This is. I, I'll. I'm. I'm backtracking a little bit to. Um, to what I had said earlier, which is if you can afford to pay for your program without without a loan. Now, some. Now, some people. A lot of people do this. They stay back, in the country of their education for two years. They pay off that loan. And they return. A lot of countries do that. Okay. So if you think, okay, you know what. The amount of money that I make by and okay again think of the worst case scenario. Let's let's use a use an actual example. You get into um, Europe, say say you get into Berlin. Okay, you get get into the Free University of Berlin. You do a master's in um, I don't know. Let's say psychology. I don't even know if Berlin offers psychology, but this is a hypothetical situation. So stay with me. Um, Say you get into a do a master you get you get into do a master's in psychology from the University of Berlin, and say after that you get two years to find a job in the area of your studies, which is usually the condition that people offer. They say if you don't get a job within the within the next two years, you're gonna have to scoot from our country. Um, but if you do get a job, then please stay and please provide your skilled uh, inputs into the, into our economy. Now, what happens to a lot of people during this two-year period is that in some cases, now this is not the case with everybody. I know a lot of people who have successfully managed to do that and stayed back. But in some cases, you might not actually meet the requirements for your um, for your uh, for the for the degree that you had studied, right? So you might you might actually end up as a barrister at Starbucks, you know. Now, if you were a barrister at Starbucks for the next two years in Berlin. The chances are you would still manage to save somehow live like a really, you know, um, uh, economical life and somehow you'd, you'd be able to like pay off, I would say, at least an easy 90 percent of your of your education. Right. Because Berlin doesn't doesn't charge that much for your education anyway. You'll probably have only a bunch of admin fees or whatever, and then you've paid it off. Right. But you still don't land a job in psychology. But then you come back and you're like, OK, that was not so bad. I stayed in Berlin for two years plus, you know, the other two years I, I had to spend to study. I did four years in Berlin. I paid off my loan and I've come back. Not so bad. Um, um, so so I want you to think about the ROI, right? The return on investment. So you're putting in a certain amount of money. How much are you getting out of it? If you're putting in a certain of money and you spend the next 20 years paying off this loan, is the return on investment, uh, and, and by which I mean, you may have paid off that loan, you, you may be paying off a loan over 20 years, but say you come back to India and you actually get like a 30 lakh job, uh, you know, 30 lakh per annum job, 
then then the ROI still kind of works out, right? I mean, I mean, obviously, if if you if you live in another country and you and you know making thirty lakhs not a big deal, like you can you can make thirty lakhs in in just about any other country, um, like Australia or New Zealand or uh, or the or the US, uh, pretty easily. You know, uh, you wouldn't even have to go that high up. But say you're you're coming back to India and you say you've done an MBA from a really fancy school, but it didn't afford it didn't allow you to stay back. And you come back to India, you get a thirty lakh job. The ROI still works out, you know. Um, so, so the thing, the thing that I want you to do is do uh, for for all of you economic students out there, do a cost benefit analysis, you know. Um, literally, like, and I. By the way, I used to do this for like my friendships and my, you know, the, you know, back in the day, I used to just like put it down. I used to like make an Excel sheet and I used to say what are the costs of doing this and what are the benefits of doing this and and I, and i think that's great for the decision making process in anything in your life you make you 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 make a small little table and all you have to do is check whether the benefits outweigh significantly the the cost to that decision right and if the and, and if the costs are higher obviously don't do it like it just doesn't make any sense um so so think about those these different scenarios look a lot of again a lot of education consultants um, across the board are pretty, you know, um, they 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 tend to kind of push you towards uh, towards a lot of your life decisions by painting a very optimistic picture. But I'm trying to paint for you a more realistic one because, um, yeah, I I I guess I just don't want you to suffer the the you know the stuff that a lot of my friends, a lot of my colleagues have suffered in the past. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, okay. Don't fall for delusions. Now, um, yeah. I was remember I was telling you all that I had friends who were like, "Oh, we're going to take an education loan, and then we're going to go to Oxford, and we're going to study, and then once we go to Oxford, we're going to get this million dollar job that's going to, uh, you know, buy us our dream private jet in ten years flat." That's not what happened. A lot of people actually had to come back, and then they were paying off their loans for the rest of their lives. I mean, well, hopefully not for the rest of their lives. Um, but, you know, um, just, just don't be delusional. Um, you know, like keep checking yourself. Um, so yeah, these are, these, are, these are just some of the decision-making reflections that I want you to like really sit down uh, with and, and think about. Um, Leah, could you move forward, please? Okay. Another thing to also consider is going abroad is not for everybody, right? Um, going abroad might, in fact, not be great for for your life, for your particular life, and for the particular areas in which you might be interested in. Um, so, for example, you can stay in India and live a pretty, you know, um, comfortable life if you say get into the civil services. Um, you know, um, in our batch, we have. Um, Furfa, who's who's an IFS officer, and we have um, Nikhil, who's uh, I think uh, I, I think he's in like the civil the state civil services. Um, so there are people who've done you know just fine, uh, and and they have and they haven't had to uh, you know study abroad to 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 to, to do that. Um, so you can get into civil services, you can get into government jobs that give you like amazing benefits. Um, and and that offers you a lot of stability and that offers you a lot of um you know privileges in, in in many ways um if you think that you know what i'm so done with studies i i'd rather spend that 30 lakh that i would have spent on an education to invest in a business and and like you know i have a cousin who's done that he he was like he told his parents he was like look i know you i know you really want me to do an mba but i'm not interested in, in, in an mba i'm interested in baking cookies and his, and he was like you know what if you if you really do have that thirty lakhs, can you invest it in my cookie business? And they did. And guess what? He has a thriving cookie business in Hyderabad right now, and and is doing really well, right? Um. So if you have a business idea, um, you know, uh, Sean, who by the way was literally like the naughtiest kid in our batch in our class, he was the one who was the photographer for, and even Rajiv, you know. They both do wedding photography, and and Sean, in fact, was a photographer for Deepika and Ranveer's uh, wedding. So you know, and and like he, the other the other time uh, when um, well, 
I'm already married, but um, uh, I think I, I think I was like, oh, Sean, how much do you charge for wedding photography? He's like, yeah, I'll give you a friend discount of one lakh a day. I was like, wow, thanks, Sean. So, so you can get into you know um, a whole area of uh, business. So I, I I know I know one of our um, our uh, friends is also uh, you know she's starting a hostel in in uh, the mountains in, in the Himalayas. There's a lot of things that you can do, uh, and I don't want I don't, I don't want you to think that like studying abroad is like like the answer and solution to it all. You know, it could just be you could literally be running a hostel and still meeting people from all over the world and having fun. Um, what fun? I that I leave that to you. Okay, uh, you could get into academia. Um, let me tell you, the government pays uh, professors in government colleges a pretty good amount of money. You know, if you clear your NET, uh, net and stuff of like that, you're you're kind of on your way, you know. You you um, but this is of course if you land a proper tenured position. But um, if you if you think that uh, you know academics is for you, um, you can actually get paid a pretty decent amount. And again, a lot of there's a lot of stability with academia as well. Um, and you could just be from the privileged class of people who are like, money's not an issue for me, um, you know. And I'm I guess I'm just gonna like do a nine to five job and I don't have to worry about like building property or, you know, uh, expanding my real estate portfolio and you're fine. So there's a whole host of options that are available to you. Uh, if if you say, actually, I like the idea of going abroad, but I don't have to go there to study. I can just, you know, backpack across Europe or like do a small short course and then stay there and, you know, live and meet friends and then come back and, and you know, you're okay with it. Um, so a lot of people actually go abroad because they think there's a lot of prestige attached to it. But, you know, when it's like uh, seven in the evening and the sun has set at four, 4 p.m. and it's uh, snowing and you're walking in the snow with like three grocery bags, you might rethink that decision and say, hmm, not sure if this was like the best best decision of my life. So, so I, so again, I, I'm, t- I'm telling you about all the size of the coin, okay? Like, but, but personally, I had a great time going abroad. I've made friends for life from all over the world. Uh, and it has made me a global citizen. And um, um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I bear, I bear no um, judgment or grudge to anyone who decides otherwise. Um, Leah, could you move on? Yeah, so, you know, um, if you, there, there are advantages, right? You stay in India, there's community, um, there's a much lower cost of living. There's more work-life balance. You're definitely a first-class citizen, um, you know, and there's a very high chance that, unlike me, you're not the dishwasher, vacuum cleaner, or the washing machine. Um, so there's a great standard of living, you know, in, in India, which I think a lot of people don't realize. And there's a, and there's a great sense of community, which is both annoying because everyone's always in your business, but also very heartwarming because you're never really truly alone. Um, but if you know if that's not for you, uh, if you're like, no, actually, I just want people to stay out of my head, uh, then actually going abroad might be like a much better option. Um, but don't say it while you're staying at your parents' house, okay? Like once you leave and have your own space, and then you're like, oh, actually, this is quite nice. Then you tell me that. Um, going abroad, uh, obviously you know, the chance of you making money are much higher. Uh, you know, you can work, as I was saying, you can work in a cafe and you'll you'll make a really decent amount of money. Um, and, but of course, it's a higher cost of living, uh, but you also have global exposure and you have opportunities at hand. However, many, many times you are in fact a second class citizen and you might be kicked out of that country by whim. Um, so I just, again, Think about this, okay? Like, wh- whatever decision you make at the end of the day is totally up to you. Uh, but this is something something to, to, to like reflect on. Okay, Leah, let's go ahead. Okay. Now, if you've said you've st- you've all stayed with me so far, now you're like, no, 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 Devia, actually. I do want to go abroad, get to the point. This is why I'm here. This is why I'm spending my evening listening to you blabber on. 
then I'm then I'm gonna say to you, all right, you're all set. Here's a mini master sheet. One, okay. Before this, one, I'm assuming by this time you've already made your Excel sheet for your scholarships, and you've already made your Excel sheet for your education for for all your opportunities, right? Okay. Next, get your passport ready to apply. Uh, I hadn't left the country until I mean, actually, I, that's not true. I had left the country, but I didn't have a passport. Um, I was on my, I was on a child dependent passport or whatever. I don't really know. Um, but anyway, I don't have a passport. So the first, so a lot of applications require you to first give your passport number, and then you can move forward in the application. So one, get your passport ready. Um, two, almost every decent university in the world. Um, requires you to pay application fees, which means you are going to be spending a considerable amount of money just applying. Um, you know, um, I would say I would say for application and um, you know other miscellaneous expenses like tests and exams and whatnot, just keep about. You would have to save up at least. I, I mean, this is of course a generous estimate. It depends on which which places you apply to, but I would say. Keep at least a minimum of fifty thousand aside, um, and this is if you even want to get to the scholarship stage. So, unfortunately, applying abroad means that you would have to um, have that entire. Um, you would have to have a corpus uh, to draw from. However, there are some universities uh, that offer a need-based um, application waiver, so you can actually write to them and say, "Look, I don't have the money to afford um, to apply even." Um, is there any way that you can uh, waive off the application fee for me? And some universities actually say, OK, you know what? We'll 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 waive it for you. Um, and then some universities have like this criteria. If you're a woman of color or whatever, they'll waive it off for you. Stuff like that. Um, OK, uh, and you and then of course you create an Excel sheet with your shortlisted universities, your deadlines, your scholarship deadlines. Um, now, one more thing that I also, again, a side note. When you're making that Excel sheet with the shortlisted universities. Um, a, put the shortlisted universities down. B, put down their application deadlines, put in their, you know, their paperwork requirement um, on, on, on a third column. On another column, you know, I, and, I, and, I, and a lot of people don't do this, but I'm going to ask you to do this. Um, on, on, on another column, put in one one area where you are talking about um where you're talking where, 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 where you're asking yourself have i reached out to someone from the department yes or no so now this is a total tail malish muscafine thing to do but i still say do it okay like you're not, not going to lose anything uh but you have to be smart about it okay but here's what i what i did i would write to professors from different universities and say professor so and so your publication on XYZ uh, paper was really quite inspiring. And I'm so in awe of your work. And I'm really interested in your program, especially in the module that you specifically are teaching. And I was wondering, given my profile and and my future interest in XYZ, if, if you thought I was a suitable candidate. Now, usually, um, or, or if you had any advice for me, and usually uh, people respond, now, I, I can't speak for every country, but usually people respond quite positively. They say, oh, we don't, your profile sounds interesting. We totally encourage you to apply, uh, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Um, now, what happens there is that, um, you know, the professor might at the very least note your name when when going through like hundreds of applications. So it's just a good way. It's just a good way to like be noticed, but it's not like it's not something that that you have to do. It's something that over and to and to cutlets like myself have done in the past. Um, OK, so save up for application fees. Start with, OK, so you, you're creating this Excel sheet with the shortlisted universities, the deadlines, the scholarship deadlines, the the professors you may or may not have reached out to the the transcripts that you that you're required to submit. Some of them require TOEFL or IELTS. Some of them don't. Some of them require GRE or like other entrance exams. So keep a list of all of that. Basically, you should have one master sheet, one master Excel sheet that has one university admission tab and one scholarship admission tab and where you're able to see all the data in a very clear uh, and very um, organized fashion. Um, 
another thing to bear in mind is that you have to speak to your potential referees, okay? Um, whichever professor is writing your SOPs for you, I mean, your sorry, your, your, your uh, recommendation letters for you are taking time out of their busy schedule to sit and figure out that university's portal, then upload, then sign, then answer a couple of questions that the, that the university might ask of them. So that's a lot of time. They're actually doing you like a really, really big favor. I mean, you can ask Anita, man, like she's spent a lot of time doing my reference letters. Um, but usually, usually, you know, every every college, see, the thing is, um, colleges do want you to excel. You know, they, they do want you to uh, do, uh, I mean, professors want, want that their students do well. So most people are happy to do it, but you have to be careful that you're not, that you're not asking them to send it like, with one day to the deadline, you know, um, be try to be respectful of their time. Um, some professors ask you to send a draft, and that's completely fine. But um, you know, uh, the, the idea is that you don't see the recommendation letter. So um, some people just say, some professors just say, we want a draft of like all the things you've done. Um, so you know, you could send a list of that, or you know. Um, Figure it out. Talk to your uh, referees because you might put in a you, you don't do not whatever happens do not key in a referee's name without asking for their permission first. Because what will happen is the university is going to just send them and for the in the, in all likelihood the university is just just going to send them an automated email saying, "Hi, so and so has requested an SOP for, from you," and then the professor is going to be like, "But I'm not interested in writing an SOP for you." And then you're just stuck, you know, you're just like, oh, my God, like one of my key referees doesn't want to, you know, write anything good about me. And in fact, it might it might work against you because they might not say something nice about you if you haven't taken their permission. So speak to your potential referees. Most universities require three to four referees. Uh, no, sorry, two, two to three referees to say nice things on your behalf. Also, make sure that they like you, right? Like imagine you go to a professor who's who's who doesn't like you. And then they're, they're not going to say anything nice about you. So, you know, um, make sure that make sure that you've picked the right ones as well. Um, and, and oh, and also in some places uh, they they allow you to. Um, sometimes you can you can combine like professors with like one person who you've worked with or who who's supervised you or whatever. Um, and we've already spoken about this. You know, you look at the places with the highest highest chance of getting in, plus affordability uh, in, in the in the event that you don't get a scholarship. Um, prepare for all your transcripts to be in hand. Okay. Um, usually, people people require you to um, have all your university transcripts in hand, your degree certificate in hand. Um, in many cases, your uh, your language require requ or test requirements in hand. Um, and of course, your passport. So make sure that you have a PDF, a co clear colored PDF of all those documents. Um, if there are any entrance uh, exams or tests that you're required to take, please ensure that you do it well in advance. Okay, so if you think that there's an application deadline that's coming in on Jan 22nd, you don't do the GRE like on Jan 21st, obviously, because your marks are going to take probably two, two to three weeks to show up. So make sure you're planning all these things um, well in advance. Um, also, uh, so, so, um, okay, for Josephs, there's, uh, I don't know if that's still the case, by the way, but in, in my time, the, the marks transcript clearly said language of instruction English. So I would just write to the different university. Basically, I was really lazy to do TOEFL. Um, although I did end up doing it, but anyway, I, I initially I was lazy to do it and I, and I hadn't done it in time for my Cambridge and Oxford application. And I wrote to the, uh, universities, universities and I said, look, I have this, uh, I applied for, I applied for a language, uh, test waiver. I said, my language of instruction is English and literally my first language is English. Uh, so, um, so can you, uh, you know, accept this and they accepted it. So, um, just just be careful about that. You know, if 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 there are like five universities and if you've written to all five universities and if they've all waived up the language requirement, then you save up on whatever, 12,000 or 13,000 rupees, right? Because you don't have to do the language uh, entrance exam anymore. Um, okay. A word of unsolicited advice. A lot of people apply for courses that they may be very, very interested in, but for which they might not be that skilled. 
right? So, um, you know, I cannot draw a straight line. Um, my my biggest artistic achievement is drawing a stick horse. Um, and like, even if I wanted to, like, I love art, right? I love art history. Like, I like I know I I know the difference between a Renoir and a Rothko, but but if I had to join an art course, um, I would I would be awful at it. So um, ensure that whatever subject you're applying for is a subject where your interests uh, intersect with your skills, and that that and that's true for like you know any any professional decision you might be taking. You you should be interested in it because if you hate it, you're not going to be you're just going to be miserable. You're going to make everyone else around you miserable, and you won't excel if you're not interested in it. And also, it needs to intersect with your skills, uh, which means what are you good at, right? Now, my interests are talking to people, but what are my skills? My skills are writing and editing. So what job do I do? I do, I do socially conscious editing, right? So all my editing work is based on helping people um, it's because I've, I'm an editor for Menstrupedia and Menstrupedia is a, you know, a menstrual health uh, social initiative. Um, and I and I help people out independently with the SOPs, and I do it to raise money for charity. Um, so, so, you know, I'm doing something where my interests and my skills are intersecting. Um, now, finally, once you're done putting this en entire mini master sheet together, the I do want to go abroad crew. All of you need to um, zero down on your top five programs. Okay. You practically cannot apply for 10 programs. If you apply for 10 programs, then do you know how many referees you're going to be running after? 30 referees, like 30, uh, maybe, or maybe not 30 referees, but 30 reference letters, right? Maybe it's the same re four referee doing the same thing over and over again. But you're basically going to be um, chasing after people 30 times, which is insane. You're also going to be spending uh, you know, uh, a shameful, no, not shameful. Uh, what's the what's the more polite word? An obnoxious amount of money uh, putting in application. So don't do that. Um, zero down on your top five universities. Uh, my uh, my take on it is that you should have at least one or two dream universities where you might not get in, but where you would regret not having applied to. And then, um, and then you know maybe. Uh, the other two can be safe bets, and then one can be like a really terrible university with like a decent reputation where your chance of getting a scholarship are high, right? So that way you kind of like, you know how, uh, since you're all econ students, you know how, how when you do like investments, right? Most people um, divide up their investments in a, in a diversified, diversified portfolio. Some people invest a little bit in equity. Some people invest a little bit in debt. So they, they, diver, they, they diversify their portfolio to ensure maximum returns. And that's exactly what you're doing with the university applications as well. So you zero down your top five, and then you get down to the to the interesting, um, edifying, and enlightening task of uh, designing your resume and writing down your SOP, also known as your statement of purpose or your motivation letter. Um, oh, Leah, could you uh, move forward? Um, so what this means? Excuse me, ma'am. Yeah. I'm sorry to interject, but uh, we only have about 15 minutes or so left oh. uh, in the session. So. Oh, okay. I'm gonna race forward. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um. Okay. Could you could you move forward, Leah? I'll I'll race. I'll race. Okay. Move, 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 move. Sorry. Oh, I wish you told me earlier. Okay. All right. Um. An SOP, as you all know, yeah, good. An SOP, as you all know, is like, um, you know, a really important part because it's basically what gets you in. Um, I only have um, a pretty simple recipe for that. One is introduce your life story, okay? Your life story is what makes you unique. So introduce your life story and then throw in, you're cooking, okay? This is a, this is a, this is a cooking act. You throw in your achievements, okay? Oh, I was the head of this, uh, this, uh, you know, um, this club or that club, you, you, you show that you show that you've been doing things in a coherent way. So, for example, if you're applying for, um, you know, an English literature masters, 
maybe it won't make that much sense to talk about um, you know how how you how you studied uh, statistics for example um, spice it up with why you are the best fit for the school usually uh, people want to know why they should pick you over somebody else so you say you know what I I've done all these things and and um, and I also have the kind of background you're looking for the, the kind of background you've specified so I'm the best fit you should pick me um, you know I'll sweeten 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 it up by your interest and fit into the subject matter talk about uh, the modules in the program that you like uh, flavor it up with what you think you can contribute to the university with usually that's sports or extracurriculars or it can be something as simple as engaging discussion um, and then um, you know uh, speak about your future plans and then at the end, uh, you're, you're gonna have this recording so you can come back to this this slide um, and like all good food um, remember that you are trying not to sound overly professional but not to sound overly informal you're trying to find a balance you're trying to be honest about who you are you're trying to be authentic to your voice but at the same time you're you're maintaining a sense of professionalism right so um leah could you move forward so usually when you you do like um you know a couple of drafts um and um and then you kind of uh, arrive at a cup uh, you arrive at a at a couple of learnings one is that you realize that an sop is actually a spiritual reflection right because you're you are this is your story you're putting a story out there into the world so it's a spiritual reflection it's telling yourself that look i'm stating that these are my, my future goals so i should be working towards it i promise this to somebody else but i'm also promising this to myself um it's a great way of uh, you know assessing how far you've come and how far you'd like to go uh, and uh, one thing about an SOP is that a lot of people are like, oh, I was top in my GPA. In, I, I, was, I was the topper in my class. But really, an SOP is not about other people's achievements versus yours. It's really about, um, you know, your very specific journey, the kind of journey that you had to go through. Uh, you know, like, I, like you know, um, you didn't start off, start off in the same place as everyone else. And so an SOP is the story of how you've come so far from where you began um i think a lot of people just start you know just write an sop like like it's a uh, like it's an achievements list which is not right so uh, it's it's just an alternative perspective to to think about leah could you move forward sorry people i'm racing now um okay uh, quick tip, tips, uh, do at least like five, six drafts, take feedback. Uh, don't listen to people who are totally negative. Take only constructive feedback. As I said, don't compro compromise on your voice. Um, tweak it to personalize it to each program. Okay, so each program you talk about what's, what courses you like specifically in that program, which professors work you like specifically in that program. So, so you have five different SOPs for five different applications. Um, always proofread, make sure you don't have any spelling or grammatical errors. Um, when you're making a resume, just ensure that you are using um, a nice, clean platform like Canva. Sometimes uh, they expect the resume to be in EU format, but uh, I would say that overall, just maintain a clean, professional look. And if it's unless it's like a design or an art program, don't don't you know put too many colors. Just keep it like black and white at, at best. And um, yeah, and when you start filling in your application, upload do documents uh, that are that are clear and always always submit them in pdf format okay don't submit word documents don't submit images unless they ask you specifically to do so and always keep submissions always keep screenshots of your submissions to follow up uh, later with because sometimes universities don't let you go back to your application so in case there's, a, there's an interview afterwards and you don't know what you've said that's probably going to be a bad situation so um yeah could you move forward um okay um, yeah, uh, one more thing is that a lot of agents um, uh, tell you to uh, agents get paid by universities to get you in to get you in. So they pro they actually profit from universities. So probably don't pay full heat to them. Independent consultants probably profit from you doing well, but they like, for example, I don't do the whole job, right? I don't I just do the SOP. I don't do the rest of your application or help you out with the rest of your application and your friends and families and professors. They are invested in giving you good advice, but they, they may not be experts in their areas. So I would say find your find your balance. Um, you know, maybe take advice from everyone. But at the end, end, end of the day, I think um, 
uh, you know, uh, do as much of the work as you can by yourself because um, you need to be ethical about it. You you can never write your, you don't have anybody else write your SOP for you. Maybe they can enhance it or edit it, but you are writing your own SOP. Um, you're writing your own um, application. So that's just, that's just something to, to think about. Um, Leah, could you move forward? Okay, last but not the least, um, ask yourself if you're gonna have regrets if you don't try. And as far as I can tell, the worst thing to do is not to try. And I think we'll stop here. If you have any questions, let me know. Oh, and also I, I do this independently for charity, uh, but I can I can tell you all the details. If you just reach out to me, maybe you can, uh, maybe Shraddha, you can pass on my number or email if someone's interested. Cool, any questions? Thank you very much, ma'am. The talk was very informative. Actually, we have compiled a few questions that if I may read out to you, the, yeah, awesome. yes, ma'am. Uh, one of the questions was, hello, ma'am, I'm an art student and I want to pursue data science. So I'm mildly switching my stream. So it would be great if you could tell us some points on the career path of pursuing data science through economics as it is a growing field and economists are the ones who can transition to data science. So what are we supposed to mention in our SOP when we are when we want to change our streams? OK, you need to mention that you've made an effort to change, OK, which means you should have said, um, you know, because I was interested in changing, uh, changing fields. Now, now I am really interested in, um, uh, you know, I've done a sort of good course in the subject or I've done like I was trying to get into social science research from an arts from a humanities background, right? I'm not humanities, but social science. I mean, I was in a more I was in a more abstract field and I was trying to get into social science research, which is like, you know, learning R and softwares like that. So I said I went for a social science um, certification uh, from from Isaac. So basically show effort in having transition, show that you've done things to ensure that your transition is smoother. You've done courses, you've taken paperwork, you've maybe done a diploma alongside to show that you've you've you've, you know, um, swapped over. Ma'am, uh, the next question is, suppose I am a student of the physical sciences and I score a GPA of 6.5 in my finals. For my master's, I want to pursue management. However, some colleges accept students with a GPA of 7 plus only. Is there any way we can persuade the colleges uh, that we are applying for abroad to consider our application, especially since we are not from the science backgrounds and not from the arts backgrounds either? Yeah, so um, one of the ways in which you can do that is to write to the professors and ask, hey, is the GPA a hard requirement? In a lot of cases, they're not, by the way. They're just trying to eliminate people who are who are not, uh, you know, um, who are not meeting the cut. But sometimes, it's, sometimes you can just write to them and ask them. The other thing to also look into is while the GPA might be a certain number for some countries, uh, there are specific edu educational requirements per country. So look at the per country requirement and see if the educational requirement is slightly lower for India. That often tends to be the case. So every university has that education requirement equivalency list. So look that up. That's a good question, by the way. Uh, the next question is, if we require a scholarship for our master's abroad, should we mention it in our SOP? Nope. Your scholarship applications are different. Yes, and the final question is now that GRE has been made and has been made optional at many places, should I still give the exam? Will it give me an edge? Um, unless your score is fantabulous, I, I'm not. I, I wouldn't recommend it. And especially if they say that they're not looking for it, then it then then it's irrelevant. I think uh, someone raised their hand as well. Oh sure. Sorry, I don't know how to use Microsoft Teams. So whoever's raised their hand, just go ahead and like ask your question. Okay, since uh, no one is responding, I'm going to guess that might have been. Excuse me. Uh, hi, I had a doubt. Yeah. Hi, I'm Mihika. I am currently in 12th standard and I'm planning to pursue law abroad. And uh, as you were speaking, uh, I wanted a bit. Uh, I wanted a bit of your help, like 
how would it be studying law in the UK? And uh, uh, if you're studying law, generally, I, I mean, you know, unless you have like a visa to go abroad and live abroad, uh, generally, you know, the only places that you can study in are the UK because the UK shares. I mean, we share. We we've taken a law from from the UK, so you, you can still go to the UK, study there, and then like you know do the pass the bar here. But if you did that in, an, in another country, then you would have to try to live in that country, and there's no guarantee that you can. But if you have a means to do that, then you know then you can study law wherever you want to. But most Indians only study law in the UK, and they come back here, or they just study law here and then they practice here. Ma'am, uh, another question that just came in the chat box is, Ma'am, could you list out a few more websites that could be referred to for scholarships and other helpful information? Mm, I would say scholarship positions, honestly, like it, it has this, I think it has this algorithm where it just like draws um, from a lot of um, different sources. So I would, I would stick to scholarshippositions.com, but every single university has its own set, set of funding. Um, the only thing that I would caution you about is to check if you are eligible and your specific country is eligible. So if you're, so some some scholarships are not for Indians and others are specifically for Indians. So look into those. Otherwise, just apply to the top national ones, right? Like for for the US, it's Fulbright. For for you know for the for the, for the UK, it's um, uh, Felix and Commonwealth and Chevening. So there's a whole bunch of very specific uh, scholarships for each country that can be both at the national level and then there are others that are more specific that are at the university level and there's yet others that are more subject specific and that are funded by different um, you know academic bodies or or um, you know philanthropic uh, trusts like the Narottam Sikshastriya scholarship the Tata scholarships um, that allow you to study abroad. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, IES 106 also has a question. She's raised her hand. Okay. Um, hi, ma'am. Uh, so I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is that uh, what do you think is the most efficient time to apply? Because uh, you said something about if you get bad marks at the starting um, and then you can apply earlier and then you can submit the um, you can submit the adjusted mark sheet in the end. Yeah. Yeah, and so well, okay. So the so the thing is, uh, sh so should I apply in the fifth semester like normal people do, or should I wait until my bachelor's get over? So in those two or uh, in those two months of brief period when I have, I can apply then in 2023. So that's the first question I had. And another question I had is, I'm up, I'm doing IES right, um, but I'm interested in a uh, in a tech major that's MIS at LSC. Um, so in the SOP, um, will it help if I connect the modules of study to my bachelor's to how that can help me bring a unique perspective in studying the master's degree? Um, OK, first qu first question. Um, I think given your specific um, area of interest, um, first question is I would say apply a little later when your marks look much better because I, I, I imagine that that course is quite competitive. So you don't want to lose out because of, um, you know, your marks. Um, the second is that, yes, you can use subjects to connect to, you know, why it would be relevant to that program. But as I said earlier, if you're transitioning into a different field, I really do think that you should show some effort. You should demonstrate effort, and that means that you should have done, you know, certificate courses or, um, you know, um, say, say like, a diploma and by the way a lot of people tend to uh, you know mention like all these 101 Coursera programs don't do that okay um, try to go for something more legit you know like a six month uh, diploma or like a three month diploma from um, you know university here because that kind of just shows that you've put in more effort than the normal person because it's quite easy to sit and get all these Coursera I mean I think I still think you should do it uh, I, I just don't think that you should uh, only do that, you know, I think you should do um, other programs that could help that could demonstrate effort in transitioning. So think about the ways in which you can demonstrate effort in transitioning. I, I don't know much about the specific subject, so see what people have done to get into that subject. Just, just LinkedIn stock a whole bunch of people who've done that course and see what, what their backgrounds are. 
uh, I think like we have time for another like two or three questions, ma'am. So I'll we have we have just three more like in the chat box now. Mm-hmm. I am physically challenged. What are the possibilities of me going abroad for higher studies? Mm-hmm. Oh, um, you're you're. I think I think the pretty decent. Um, it would be a big part of your story. Obviously, remember we said that your SOP is basically your personal story. Um, but generally, the West is pretty good with like you know accessibility. Uh, you might have to look up the most accessible institutions. But most, uh, you know, I I know for a fact that I've studied with people with uh, all kinds of, um, you know, who are living independently, by the way, in independent living, who are, uh, you know, who are able to manage with their. Um, I don't I don't know about your specific physical um, uh, disability, but, um, you know, uh, I I had a friend who uh, who was on a wheelchair here. But when he went to the to the UK, he he was no more on a wheelchair, but he was more on a um, you know, a more transportable um, wheelchair that they have there, which is you know designed for that. So if you can arrange for that to be um, you know purchased for you, I think you can definitely manage. Um, and also like you have you know access much more accessible bathrooms and stuff like that. So you would you would be able to. I think you would be able to do it. Um, and and I, and I do believe they might have a quota or a scholarship. Uh, category that maybe you could you know capitalize on as well so um definitely look into that ma'am the next question from the chat box is how do i design my resume i have done a bunch of extracurricular activities but i'm unable to discern what activities actually matter more and what is more impactful like credit courses or association activities or paper presentations where do i begin um I would say it depends a lot on the program that you're applying for, but generally, um, here's what I did. I divided up my uh, resume into education, work experience, leadership qualities, um, and I think I put awards or extracurricular activities or something. So I just put different categories and I just list, listed them out. Um, I would say don't put in everything. Uh, you know, you can put in credit courses, but if you have like, I don't know, eight credit courses, that's not a smart thing to do. Um, but, but I would say, you know, like the most, like the things that are most impressive about your resume need to be on your resume. Um, but, but be careful not to, not, not to dilute it. So, um, you know, take like, you literally take a highlighter and say, okay, I'm going to put only, you know, 20 things on my resume and like list out all your achievements and then, and then, you know, put it out. But if you have too many, here's another hack that I have. Put in all the highlights under the under the resume, but put in those achievements into your SOP. Like, oh, I've I've done these credit courses, you know. So, so so that way you cover you cover ground, but your resume only has the highlights. And uh, finally, we have a hand raised by Ishani Sen. So, uh, if you could unmute and ask a question. I like the whole. Uh, workshop it's really nice um so my question was um what is your opinion on taking gap years and how it affects your study abroad oh i highly recommend it like i i spent two years just backpacking the country and then later on backpacking the world so i i highly recommend it i think it i mean even if it's not going to be i mean you know, you you should be doing something during that time. You know, you shouldn't you shouldn't like not do anything professionally. So maybe do something on the side or do like a part time job. I was working remotely for the most part, but I know that it really broadened my perspective to have done that. You know, to have just like I don't know, I spent months in Dharamshala and I spent months like I I just I just spent months like a whole. You know, people thought I was a little insane, but. I had a lot of fun and I was doing a lot of things. I was doing field research. I was doing, you know, I was doing things that were building up my resume at the same time. You know, like I was doing field research in, in Badami, but I was also in a beautiful tourist spot because Badami is like a beautiful tourist spot in Karnataka. But I was still, you know, uh, doing something that was going to add to my resume. So try to find a balance um, where you're, you know, you're taking a gap year and doing things you love, but you're also doing things that um, are going to help in building up your profile to where you want to see it be. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I would like, uh, I thank you everyone, everyone for your patience. And I especially thank ma'am for clearing all the doubts and questions with such detail. Uh, I would like to ask all the faculty 
participants and guests to switch on the cameras so that we can have a group picture. Oh, that's lovely. Shraddha, have you taken the picture? Um, yeah, it's done. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I, you know, I, I feel like I rushed the second part and I didn't, I didn't answer. I was trying to answer your questions briefly, but um, do, you know, do feel free to, um, to reach out to me via email. Shraddha has my email, so ask, ask Shraddha. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, feel, feel totally, uh, free, uh, to, to reach out. Um, I also charge, uh, oops, I have a dog as company right now. Um, so I'm sorry if there's a little bit of barking. Um, and, uh, I, I, I just feel like, I, I just feel like, uh, if you're really interested in, like you spend lakhs of money on applying abroad, right? So, um, you know, if, if you do, if you do want to, um, take professional help uh i'm 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 pretty reachable but i only take two students a month because i do this for charity um so i'm i'm booked out for this month but it, but i'm i'm free for next month um so just make sure you 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 latch on to me quicker than later thank you ma'am i'm sure our students will make uh, great use of the opportunity now it is my privilege to propose a vote of thanks and to acknowledge the contribution of those who have worked hard to make this event a success. I, Thirut Narang, on behalf of the Department of Economics, St. Joseph's College, and the entire fraternity of the institution, would like to extend my most sincere thanks to the almighty God for making today's event a resounding success. I would like to extend my sincere regards to our chief guest, Ms. Divya Rosalind David, who, spend, who spared time from her busy schedule to grace us on this occasion. Today, we had the opportunity to hear your thoughts, and this is going to help many of our students in their future endeavors. On behalf of my colleagues and, and associations, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to Ms. Mr. Clement D'Souza, Dean of the School of Humanities, Ms. Anita Norona, Head of the Department of Economics, Mr. Keshav Murthy, Coordinator for Economics Forum, Ms. Teresa Joy, Coordinator for Economica, and all the faculty members, Professor Tulika, Professor Nikhil, Professor Anne Francis, Professor Raisa, and Professor Padmaja. I would also like to thank the core committee members of the Economics Forum and Economica. A big thank you to the volunteers who have worked behind the scenes to make sure that the event executed smoothly. Last but not least, I would like to thank the audience for their interest and enthusiasm in making this event as lively as possible. Thank you. Before we end today's event though, I would like to bring attention for all, uh, I would like to take the attention of all the participants to mention that there will be a feedback form posted in the chat box. We'd like to request that you take the time out to fill the form and you will be receiving your certificates through the emails that you fill in. Our next session will be on, uh, which will be the fifth lecture of the lecture series, will be on 26th of November. Information on it will be posted in your respective class groups. Thank you for the lively response and we hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. This was great. Thanks. Thank you so much, Divya. It was a wonderful session. And uh, yeah, I will catch you on the other side. So have a good day and uh, good night.